Dude, here's my favorite of all the whole Jedi. Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's my favorite. He's just so fantastic with his mind. Feel how light that is. It's as light as a feather. Oh, look at my Yoda. He loves these things. Now that's a boy there. You know what? He if you take him out of the box, he'll run around all over the floor and talk. And you can ask him certain things and he'll answer you. I got two of them. I sense your fear. You are right to be afraid. He got killed. I'll tell you the reason I like it, because I never had toys when I was growing up. The little boy in me just loved the movie and the characters. It was just so fantastic, you know? I'm going to give them to my kids when I'm gone. Art is a story. I don't know no other way you can say what art is besides it. it tells a story. I'm telling a story about my life and it's going to take 50 pictures to do it. I got eight done. It's going to take 50. I'm putting these pictures on here and they'll never fade away. Never. Never dreamed that I had the talent to become an artist. But my wife kept telling me, oh, you can do it. You got talent, Winford. You can do this and you can, but you know, wives can say them kind of things, you know. But is it true? Winford has a true account of how we live, how we survive in the South. When a patient walks into my room, they expect to have a seat and for me to talk with them about their history, about their journey. I take that information and I use it to help them heal. I need to look at history. And sometimes patients come in and tell you horror stories, but I can't discard it because I need it all to help that patient to live. I'm a physician, but I'm also an artist. I see myself a little bit of both. Winford is an artist, we're both from the South, and I had the opportunity to go to one of his art shows, and there he was. He's had a lot of health problems, hypertension, diabetes, prolonged over 40 years of stress. And I think that stress interferes with your ability to sleep. So for how many hours of sleep you get a night? Three or four. Three or four hours? Mm-hmm. And that's with the medicine? Yeah. Without the medicine, what you get? Without the medicine, I get nothing. And this been going on for how long? About four years. Whenever he do one of those pictures, he gets sick. He have to go to the doctor and she has to talk to him and he has to double up on that medicine in order to get some rest. For you, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. So it traumatizes you again and make you relive what you had gone through. Exactly. And the thing is that sometime acknowledging the history does help some people to heal. It may help other people. And Not me, that. though. I, I don't think it does. It's a different kind of art than healing. It's My kind is mm -hmm. not healing. Do this cap. Do his face. Put it on his ear. Do I put hope in my art? Not, not much. 
since everything is done from the past, there's not much hope in it. I can sit down and start thinking in my mind, I go back when I was five and six years old, I can remember. God gave me a good memory. We lived on a plantation and that was the early 60s. Uh, it don't take long for you to realize that something's wrong with picking cotton every day, all day. You start out on your rows, you can't see the end. You spend all day and you never get to the end of your row. At the time I was 14, I ran away from, not home, but I ran away from the cotton field. So I was doing everything I thought possible to live a different type of life. That's a signal that she know I'm, I'm working. She hear this. And I go through the night, three or four, five o'clock in the morning. And when she don't hear that, she, of course, she's down the stairs like a bullet. The trauma that he's seen the, and the trouble he has that, to go to sleep and the rest, I've seen that increase as he get older. The dramatic stuff, that's when you have a problem. But those are the ones he really need to get done. Sometimes he wakes up, completely up, calling whoever it is that's running him. He call him by name, and he'll be saying, stop. If I don't take my medicine, then I can't sleep with Patsy. Because I'm going through, if I'm dreaming, I may, I may punch Patsy. Let me go back to the scar that I'm carrying. I joined the Civil Rights Movement at 14 years old. When you are part of the movement, you make a name for yourself. And all the white people know you. And they are waiting to get their hands on you. I stayed in jail over a year with no charges. Nothing. So uh, I took a roll of toilet paper, stuck it in the jar, flooded the jail. And when the sheriff came back, he came back and he was going through the nigger thing with me. He kicked me two or three times. And about the third time he kicked me, I decided I wouldn't let him kick me anymore. Grabbed his legs and I threw him to the ground. And he uh, went for his gun. I took it away from him, and he's begging me not to shoot him. So I said, well, I'm not going to shoot you, but I'm going to lock you up. So I locked him in the cell, and I fled. Went to this house of civil rights workers, I thought. The woman answered the door, and I told her what had happened. She went in the next room and called the police. The next thing I know, every white man in Cusper, Georgia, standing out there in the yard. Threw me in the trunk of the car, about a 30 minute ride, and then they opened up the trunk. I saw these ropes hanging from the tree, nooses. A place designed to look like to hang people. But they put the rope up around my feet, pulled me up in the tree. Here comes the deputy sheriff that I locked in the cell, and he's got a knife. And he come up and he grabbed my private parts. And he took his knife and he stuck me. They was going to castrate me and then hang me and burn me. I was 19 years old, and there I am, bleeding like a pig, hanging up in a tree, ready to be slaughtered like a hog. And then another white man grabbed his arm and told him, don't do that. So we got better things we can do with this nigga. I took my shirt. Rolled it up, put between my legs like that when I was in the trunk of the car and squeezed my legs together. I saved myself.
My mother used to tell me, she said, you cannot internalize the pain. If you internalize that pain, it just chips away at you. In this country, no one really generally talk about the people who were lynched. Sometimes they would lynch people, they put them in the water with weights so the family would never see them again. Sometimes they would take the bodies and cut them up and sell the pieces. Sometimes they would take the body after they lynched it and burn it up so the families would not have anything. Those are ones that were recorded. What about the ones that were not recorded? There was close to three to 4,000 people who were lynched. And a lot of these people never got a funeral. It was often too dangerous for the families to retrieve those bodies. And sometimes there was no bodies to retrieve. It's not just black history. This is American history. Don't survive a lynching. Usually, when you lynch, you dead. I just happened to be one man that was saved. I had to have hurt me. I had to have kept me from being maybe what I could have been. Yes, it has. It held me back because it's brutal, and no one wants to talk about it. First time I saw you, I was trying to, medically speaking, I was trying to figure out why does he have these on his hand? Those why? are chain gang marks. Well, one more than the other. Why this one more than this one? Because that's my punching hand. Uh-huh. <laughs> I didn't learn to box, I learned to survive. Working on the highways and byways and wearing. You hear them moaning their lives away. Then you hear somebody say, Well, don't you know that's the sound of the men working on the chain? Wow. I like the part. That's beautiful. Y'all gonna make me cry when you. <laughs> It's a beautiful morning. Mm-hmm. You got your long johns on? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Then I can walk you to Georgia. What you think? You can lean against me. I'm sorry, lean on your that way. I got it. Don't you see how I'm a, I'm a strong Georgia girl? I see that. That's right. <clears throat> I'm, giving, I'm giving out. Well, it's a pretty day to do that on. You pick cotton before? You know it. <laughs> We used to pour water in there, but they, they got hip to that. Oh, really? Yeah. Only thing way more, put a brick in it. You, did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you put a brick in it? Yeah. Oh, God, I didn't know about that one. <laughs> yeah, I didn't put yeah. a brick. <laughs> Getting ready for tomorrow, the 29th, trying to pull it all together. Hey, Nathaniel, uh, you know that painting I did with the with the KKK? Yeah. Could you bring it to me in Springfield? I decided to have a funeral for the over 4,000 African Americans who were lynched in the United States to close that chapter and move forward. America has to do the same thing to help heal this country. You'll get some pushback from people. Why do you want to stir that up? It hasn't been stirred enough. People are saying, uh, that's so depressing. I say, well, if you think it's depressing, try hanging from a tree. What can I do? I can't bring them back, but I can give them a prayer.
Good evening. Good evening. I'm Dr. Shirley Jackson Whitaker. And the question we ask tonight is, why do we need to be here? We need to be here because our country needs to heal. And some bad things happen in this country where Americans tortured other Americans due to the color of their skin. That went on so long in America. What are you going to do about it? Because I remember as a little girl when we went to a funeral and they lowered that casket in the ground, the minister would say, ashes to ashes. Dust to dust. A lot of our people never got there. So we're looking back in history so this patient can live. We're looking back in history so this patient can thrive. We're looking back in history so this patient can become very strong. But this patient can only live and get stronger if we're willing to look back. So tonight we start. There's an African proverb that says, you speak my name and I will live forever. So tonight we will speak some names. My name is Nasir and I'm re representing Hamlet. My name is Mary Turner. I was the 19 year old pregnant wife of the wonderful Hayes Turner. My name is Lamar Thomas and I'm representing an unnamed Negro. But when I confronted his murderers, they lynched me and burned my body. My name's Kaya Bellamy, and I'm represent, representing Eugene Azar. They ripped my unborn baby out of my belly, ensuring his death along with mine. I am James Howard, and they told me I had a choice. Either I could die with my son, or I could watch him die and live to tell the story. I had no choice. I had my wife and other children to look after, to live for. And as my son cried and begged and pleaded for his life, they bound his hands and feet and forced him into the river. And as I stood, trembling with tears running down my face, watching my son sink to the bottom of the river, never to rise again, never to rise again. So in unison, whoever you're representing, speak that name. That lynching is on my back and it's dragging me down. Even today, that been 40 some years ago. And even today now, it's dragging me down. 
can't rest, man. I can't rest. I lay in my bed and I can't rest. I'm running for my life every night. Somebody's after me. And I don't know what to do. I'm mad about what happened. And it didn't seem like it was nobody there to say, hey, this is wrong. Don't do it like that. It hurts me to see him in that kind of pain. That pain is there, and it needs to be erased. We commit to the ground these bodies and these souls and let us forever remember and reflect upon the lives that have been nameless and unknown for many years. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. A funeral is a healing for those that are alive, giving respect to those that have departed. I think they wanted to be remembered and to have the right of passage, the right to move on. I think I can be healed. I think I'll go to the grave with what I got holding me down and holding me back. Even though those things were done to me years ago, they're still holding me back. Can I send a message? Can I change this world? I can't change this world. I know I'm not a big enough man to do that, but I can put a dent in it. But you just keep going and going and going and going. I love you. I wish you could see me now. I wish you could see the work that I'm doing now, Mama. I wish you could be with me now. I hope you up there looking down. Looking down at your child, doing this leather work. I guess, Mama, you one of the reasons that I keep doing it. Yes, you are.